And you said the same thing in Riceville, Iowa. Riceville's the northern part of Iowa. Uh, a farmer there in Riceville said, you're not going to do this in our schools. I'm running for school board. He did run for school board. Turned out that on election day, he got busy on the farm and did not go vote. And don't think they did lost by one vote because that's not the story. The story is not a single person voted in the school board election. If he had voted for himself, he would be sitting on the school board simply by voting for himself. See, this is where change actually occurs at the the local level. That's the local focus that we have to have. Uh, Benjamin Rush, who's a founding father, one of the 250 founding fathers. John Adams said of all the 250 founding fathers, he said, Benjamin Rush is one of the three most notable. Benjamin Rush, John Adams, by the way, said it was George Washington, number one, Ben Franklin, number two, Benjamin Rush, number three. And Benjamin Rush, amazing. He started the first Sunday school movement in America, started the Bible Society in America, started the first abolition society in America, trained the first women for academic education, trained the first black physicians, started five universities, signed the declaration, ratified the constitution, served in three different president's administrations. He's called the father of public schools under the constitution. Just amazing. We know nothing about him with our education today. One of the chief people in American foundation, we know nothing about him. And significantly, he's called the father of public schools under the Constitution because of the peace that he did in 1790. In 1790, he said, you know, we used to be 13 different nations, and we were. In America, back in those early days, colonial days, we didn't really like each other. Even North and South Carolina had border wars with each other. They each had their own separate currency. If you went from North Carolina to South Carolina, you stopped at the border, exchanged your currency. I mean, we just didn't get along. We were 13 nations. We were like Europe. And now that we're a nation, Benjamin Rush says, what do we need to be teaching in our public schools if we're going to be a unified nation rather than 13 independent nations? If we're going to be one nation? And he said, real simple. He said, the number one purpose of public education in America is to teach students to love and serve God. He said, the number two purpose of public education in America is to teach students to love and serve their country. The number three purpose of public education in America is to teach students to love and serve their family. Now, notice... Notice the order that he has here. The order that he has here, most Christians I know today would say, no, 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 family should go next because family is so much more important. He said, no, you're absolutely wrong. Country is higher than family. Now, why would that be? Because he pointed out that if you ever lose control of your country, it will become the great enemy of your family. And that's exactly what we're finding now. So many of the policies we're fighting in local school districts, et cetera, it's because we haven't been engaged. We haven't been involved. We don't even know who serves because we've been too busy taking care of our family. And in the meantime, they're passing all these policies that are killing our family, killing our culture. And so as a result of that, this is where local elections have become really an emphasis in the last 18 to 24 months. I've never seen in America what I'm seeing in the last 18 to 24 months. Uh, take you to Virginia real quick. That's one of the five states that has an off-year election. They had their governor's election last November. And what happened was Facebook. Faith Wins, group that we work very closely with. I'm headed out today, actually, for Faith Wins meetings for the rest of the week. And Faith Wins went in, and we were able to identify 312 churches in Virginia. None of them are mega churches. It's just all community churches. Said, guys, you got an election coming up for governor, and you really got to do something different. Your previous governor said, he passed a law that says, if a, if a child survives an abortion, it's okay to go ahead and let that child die after it's born. We're not going to save it after it's born. And by the way, that led to the movement we now see where the governor of Maryland said, well, that's a good idea. We're going to have abortions in Maryland up to 28 days after birth. You can still abort a baby up to 28 days after they're born. California said, we can beat that. We're going to make it 30 days. You can abort a baby up to 30 days after they're born. It's already passed one of the, one of the uh, chambers in California. So with what was going on in Virginia, need something different. 312 churches got involved and said, guys, look in your own pews. Find Christians who have biblical values, biblical beliefs, who have never before registered, who have never before voted. Get them registered. Get them to go vote biblical values. Got those 312 churches came up with 77,000 individuals who had never before voted. Christians with biblical values got them registered, got them to vote. And Yonkin, who, by the way, is a reverse opposite of what the previous governor was. As a matter of fact, pastors in Virginia on Inauguration Day last uh, last January, they were really concerned because they looked at the program and there was no inaugural prayer in the program. And here's a Christian governor, no inaugural prayer. That's because he prayed his own inaugural prayer. And he prayed in Jesus' name on the Capitol steps very boldly, very openly, very, very out front. So he was elected with a margin of 64,500 votes. Oh, 
those 312 churches provided 77,000 right there. And that's, there's tens of thousands of churches in Virginia. Just that little bit of involvement made the difference. And by the way, they had 1,343 poll watchers out of those churches who decided to get involved. Second Timothy 2.5 says you can't be crowned if you don't run according to the rules. What are the rules? Most of us don't know. They learned, they identified 5.2% of the vote as being fraudulent. Now, if you take 5.2% of the vote off, that'll win most elections at that point in time. They did so many things that made a difference. There's a statement from Charles Finney. Charles Finney was in the Second Great Awakening. It's estimated that in one year alone, Charles Finney in 1857, 1858, led 100,000 people to Christ. But Charles Finney was a revivalist. He wanted America to have revivals. And in 1835, he wrote a book on how to have revivals in America. That book, it's a great book to read, but he is very different from what we hear today. He says, guys, you don't need to pray for revival. What he did was in that book, he went in and took the if-then verses in the Bible. If then, Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people which are called by my name will do this, God says, then I will do this. He says, if you want God to do that, you don't have to pray about this. Just do what he said and he will do what he said. If you do the if, he'll do the then. So he said, if you want to revive, and so that's what that book is. It's the if-then verses. And going through those if-then verses, this is what he says in lecture number 15. He said, the church must take right ground in regard to politics. Politics are part of a religion in the country as this, and Christians do their duty to the country as part of their duty to God. He says, God will bless or curse this nation according to the course that Christians take in politics. Now, Interestingly, why is this part of a revival book? Because this is lecture number 15 where he said this is a hindrance to revival. If you want to stop a revival from occurring in a nation, just stay out of politics. If you want to see a revival, you've got to get involved because righteousness exalts a nation. We know that out of scripture, Proverbs 14, 34. But the only way you get righteousness is Proverbs 29, 2. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. It's not gonna be wicked leaders that put righteous policies in that God can bless. We love to sing the song, God Bless America, but my goodness, give them something to work with. The only way you're going to do that is you've got to have leaders who will give policies that God can bless. That's what leads to revival. God bless you guys. Thanks for letting me share. <laughs>